like to introduce Tom W. He's a renowned Al-Anon speaker, and he is with us this evening to talk to us about Al-Anon. Hi, my name is Tom. And I'm in great need of 100,000 Al-Anon meetings. Um, I've been in Menlo Park for a couple of hours now, and I, uh, my fathers grew up here um, on Johnson Street, which uh, my father's father, who hid bottles in the garage, is, um, was one of the gardeners at Stanford uh, for 40 years. This is when the Irish were the day laborers. And um, so I drove around, and, and their little home is now a $12 billion two-story place, so that's kind of fun <laughs> to see. And then I went to visit the cemetery, because that's what we do, and uh, got a chance to, to renew um, the place. So it's been a nice afternoon, and I'm glad to be here. And um, when I'm asked to share at an Al-Anon meeting, um, you know, Al-Anon is such a funny dance. So some of you might not be familiar with how weird Al-Anon really gets. <laughs> so I want to explain a little bit of that to you and then, and then share some of my own stuff. Um, the way I've been educated in my own recovery is that all the different 12-step programs are friends, companions, and allies. We're not the enemy and we're not the opposition. Although when I first got sober, I would hear AA people talk about Al-Anon as if it were the enemy and they weren't joking. <laughs> so um, we, we've evolved and developed and grown, at least in some parts of the United States. I, I think that's very good. Um, so we're friends, we're companions, we're allies. But when you're at a meeting, it's really important to speak the language of the meeting. Numbers of AA people will go to Al-Anon thinking that the Al-Anons really want to hear their story. <laughs> so, now they don't. <laughs> they don't find you as interesting as you do, and they have their own craziness to talk about. So um, it, it's a... So, so it takes a while to get the Al-Anon rhythm going. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I, we call ourselves double winners, but I would never have found Al-Anon if I hadn't gotten sober first. And I was sober for a period of time when I found my own discomfort was large enough where I needed a, another program so I could, I could function. Um, lots of people get sober and join Al-Anon, and some people join Al-Anon and then get sober. I mean, it's, it's a revolving door, and I think that's kind of fun. So if, if this is one of your first Al-Anon meetings, what we will sometimes politely tell you is you should go to six or seven Al-Anon meetings to see if you like it, and that's not true. You should go to a thousand Al-Anon meetings <laughs> to see if you like, because you won't like the first 300. You will just won't <laughs> like it. They're wrong, they're too old, good heavens, there were people knitting, I have too much self-respect, I can't go back and do it. Um, but, and I, I hear people, well, I want to find a good Al-Anon meeting, and my response is, there are no good Al-Anon meetings. <laughs> you go anyway, and you make it a good Al-Anon meeting. Uh, or I don't like the meeting, I'm gonna, it's like saying, I don't like my chemotherapist, so I'm not going back to chemo. See? It saves lives. Um, when I share it in an AA meeting, um, I'll sometimes mention that I also go to Al-Anon. Um, and I did that in Marin County, and I have not been invited back to that meeting because I, <laughs> you know, uh, crossed the line. Um, and I told them at the meeting, I, I don't want to give them my Al-Anon story, but the reason I... I started going to Al-Anon is because I, I did not want to be a sober person who was shooting people. And the AAs look a little confused and say, who would you shoot? 
And they don't know that in the darkest Al-Anon meetings, the most private Al-Anon meetings, shooting is the topic. <laughs> and the question is, do you shoot to kill or do you shoot to maim? And the group frequently divides, you know, right away. So, but see, some of us, the maiming part is, they'll, you know, ankle or knee, they will always remember you when they try to move. And there's a certain satisfaction to that, you know? So I'm, uh, my al -Anon issues, rage and exhaustion. And other people have different issues why they come into al -Anon. Um, it, we have traditions in Al-Anon like all the other 12-step programs have. And uh, here's tradition five. Each Al-Anon family group has but one purpose, to help families of alcoholics. We do this by practicing the 12 steps of AA ourselves, by encouraging and understanding our alcoholic relatives, and by welcoming and giving comfort to families of alcoholics. Practicing, encouraging, understanding, welcoming, giving comfort. And sometimes if you're coming to your first Al-Anon meetings, your first thousand Al-Anon meetings, you have not felt encouraged, understood, welcomed, or comforted in a very, very long time. My sponsor, um, I, I'm an Al-Anon as, as an adult child of an alcoholic. My sponsor in uh, the program is also an adult child. My sponsor's father died when Terry was six of alcoholism, of the disease. Um, and... Uh, I understand adult children. Other people join Al-Anon because they're married to alcoholics. I've never wanted to marry an alcoholic. What, what's wrong with you? Um, but it's its own special thing, you know? And, and so the, a lot of early, early Al-Anon is a lot of women married to alcoholic men. So that was the conversation. And the face of Al-Anon has changed a lot. But I have friends who are in marriages. There's a dilemma of the alcoholic marriage. It's even a piece of literature where, uh, how can I do this a day at a time? And I don't have the insight, and I don't have the experience, so I don't sponsor people married to alcoholics because I, I don't get it. And then this meeting, I'm told, is for parents and grandparents of alcoholics and addicts. And, and again, I don't have kids. I taught kids. But that's not the same as having kids, and I'm very aware of that. I don't, uh, so when someone wants to talk to me about their kid, I refer them to a parent. You know, I don't, I've seen the movie and I've read the book, but I do not understand what you people are going through. So we talk to each other from our experience. Um, I grew up in the Bay Area, grew up in San Jose, uh, Menlo Park, um, uh, Irish Catholic Democrats on one side, Swedish Lutheran Republicans on the other side. <laughs> uh, we never use the word alcoholic. We use circumlocution. We used um, denial. We used euphemism. We spoke in code. And I was, I was a much older person before I understood the code that things operated. So on the Swedish Lutheran side, we did not have alcoholics. We had nervous people. <laughs> and they'd get so nervous, they'd get hospitalized. <laughs> and my mother, who was the youngest daughter in a big Swedish farm family, refers to her own mother as a nervous person. You know? and my mom called me once. Um, she was concerned about one of the neighbors. The neighbor parked his car on the middle of the lawn and fell asleep next to it. And what did I think? <laughs> so I asked, does he drink? And she said, of course not, but he's very nervous. So 
to the day she died, she never saw alcoholism. She was surrounded by nervous people. And on the Irish Catholic side, we didn't have alcoholics either. We had characters. <laughs> and uh, enough said, you know. <laughs> what it meant was don't let him drive. That's what it meant. But you'd, they never said that. So um, I start going to Al-Anon. Um, I am a Catholic priest. I'm a member of the Jesuit community. But what brought me to Al-Anon was my students. I was a teacher. And Al-Anon is full of teachers and social workers and uh, intensive care nurses. We who take care of people. Um, and I was teaching in Los Angeles. I, I went to Bellarmine here in San Jose, but I taught at Loyola High School in Los Angeles. And if you know LA, it's in the middle of Koreatown today, but it was just a magnificent experience for me, my first real job. And when I went back to teach as a sober person, oh, it was much more difficult. Um, <laughs> it's so much easier to teach if you can still drink. I'm, I'm just, to say that as a true statement. Um, but here's the al piece to the puzzle. High school students act exactly like alcoholics. The stories told of a little boy, he was talking to his father and he said, Daddy, when I grow up, I want to be an alcoholic. And Daddy said, Son, you can't do both. Um, <laughs> So they're 14, they're 15, they're 16, they're 17. Most of them will grow out of this, but they have all of that alcoholic behavior and craziness. And I was reacting and reacting and reacting and reacting until I became a completely exhausted, worn out person. Uh, I didn't have any Al-Anon. I didn't have any tools to protect myself. I didn't have any ways of of um, managing extremely difficult people. So I, I lasted back in the classroom for about four years, and then I had to run for my life. I was not happy. I was very angry. I was very tired. I tried my first al -Anon meeting, and it was in Los Angeles, and here's, here's my experience. Um, Episcopal Church, Wilshire Boulevard, uh, the woman who was the secretary of the meeting had been secretary for several hundred years. <laughs> and she knew everything. We were a couple of men, we sat in the back. They would read. Al Anon can read a lot. You know, you can miss the first 20 minutes of the meeting and get there in plenty of time to share, in my experience. Um, so, will someone please read? And it goes on and on and on and on. So, um, they would do all that. And then someone who had a problem would present it to herself. And she would solve the problem. <laughs> she was kind of a combination of Martha Stewart and Heloise. Um, she sure knew a lot. But she was the problem solver. Now that's not Al-Anon, that's North Korea. So <laughs> it's a different setup. Um, but that's my first experience, where because some of us, our craziness is solving everyone's problems, and our craziness is being in control, and our craziness is forcing outcomes. I mean, that's that, and we think we're managing really well, you know, until there's um, death. You know, then, we, then we just try harder. Um, so, whew, um, I was in Al-Anon for a while, I dropped out. Joining Al-Anon is kind of like uh, stopping smoking. You stop and start and stop and start and start until you finally get there. Okay, I'm, I'm in. So I left teaching and I moved to West Oakland in 1981. And I was doing social work in West Oakland. 
uh, perfect for an Al-Anon with not a very good program. And um, because it made me crazy, I started going to Al-Anon again, and then I dropped out. And when I had about 10 years sober, I was getting very close to 40 years old. Um, it was time to deal with the family. Not my job, not my profession, but with my family. And that began opening some doors. Um, so, I went to a meeting. I'm exhausted and I'm angry. And they're going through lists of things and they, they talk about some slogans and one of the first slogans I hear, I mean that I hear, is act, don't react. Act, don't react. I'm a reactor. I'm, um, I'm the youngest child in an alcoholic home. Not nightmare uh, TV alcoholic homes, you know, with, with a lot of emergency room stuff. Eisenhower Republican alcoholic home, you know, we, everyone has a job and we have issues. Um, and, um, but oh my, all that stuff. And, and I learned uh, there are certain things we don't talk about and there's a lot of things we're not going to feel and you really shouldn't trust anybody. And where appearances are everything. So, act, don't react. Uh, here's a couple problems that I continue to have. The anger comes up for me regularly, and I need a program where I can talk about that. I mentioned at a meeting in Los Angeles that I got angry a lot. And someone there said, if you were really spiritual, you wouldn't get angry. Now, each year of recovery gives you one more second of response time. <laughs> so I had about 15 seconds to respond to this stupid person. And I said, that's very helpful. <laughs> Which is sarcasm. Um, so I had to take, I mean, I, I have to have a program that deals with me as I am, not me as if I could have been if only I was more well-developed or something. So I have anger stuff regularly. I've got fear stuff regularly. Um, the powerlessness and the unmanageability comes in. Um, I, uh, what makes me afraid? Authority figures frighten me. Um, when they're around, my first response is to seduce them with charm. Uh, and if that doesn't work, I want to kill them. So, one, two. Um, and that doesn't really go very far, you know, when you're in your 50s and 60s and 70s. It just doesn't work that well as a strategy. So, I worked the election, I worked the polls in, uh, in Oakland on election day. And before you do that, you have to take a three-hour class, which I did. And I've done this before for years. I like this. I like participating in the community. But the rules and regulations concerning Election Day in California are written and developed by people with obsessive-compulsive disorder. <laughs> and there's 10,000 things that can go wrong. You have to cut this and put it there and cut this and put it there and sign that and check around. And, so I'm, I'm uh, going through this three-hour class at the Oakland City Hall, and I'm full of fear. I feel shame. I want to just walk out. Is there a back door? I, I can't stand this. I, this is overwhelming. I can't manage all this stuff. Uh, maybe I'll just go home and call in my resignation. The election's in a week. I'll just call in my resignation or just not show up, that will help. And instead of the break, I said out loud, this stuff scares me to death. And a dozen other people in the room said, me too. 
And one of the things Al-Anon has told me is I can tell the truth out loud. And there are other people who can respond. That simple acknowledgement of the fear and some people acknowledging their own stuff helped more than I could tell you. I still had anxiety, but I knew that if we went through the procedure, we're gonna, we're gonna make mistakes and it's gonna be okay. We're volunteers, and this is America, <laughs> you know? So fear comes up for me, and fear for me, and this is new, last five years. It used to be an intellectual thing. Now it's a physical thing. When I'm afraid, it's in my belly. I feel the fear. Wow. It's very uncomfortable, but I think it's progress. Instead of doing an inventory and saying, five years ago, I think I was afraid. All the evidence is here. Uh, no, today. Here's how anger works for me sometimes. When I get frightened, I get mad. And lots of times what I notice is the anger. And I don't, again, I don't necessarily feel the anger, but the thinking is angry. You know, we're going to have to shoot you. <laughs> Don't take this personally, uh, and it'll be quick, you know, unless we choose to maim you, and then we'll have another conversation. Um, but I ha being able to, to notice that and talk about that, instead of pretending everything's fine if we just smile long enough, is such a relief for me as an adult child. Um, some of us try to force the outcome you know, I had, it must be my way or we'll all die. Uh, Blanche, my, the woman who introduced me to Al-Anon is a woman out of Texas named Blanche. There's a lot of recordings of her. She talked for years and years. Died in 2000. But Blanche was also a teacher in recovery, taught English. Um, I taught history. And, and she, 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 someone gave me a cassette tape of hers which I listened to and listened to and listened to and listened to and listened to. And she mentioned a, a Peanuts cartoon where Lucy is talking to Charlie Brown and Lucy says to Charlie Brown, how many times does five go into three? And Charlie Brown says five doesn't go into three. And Lucy says it does if you push. <laughs> Well, I've done that, and uh, the results are bad. There's bad results from that. <laughs> Blanche also said, when she was growing up in northern Florida, one of the things she was taught as a little girl was, God helps those who help themselves. And she said, that's not true. God helps those who ask. And I don't always remember to ask, especially if things are going smoothly, I don't ask. But when things start exploding, I sometimes remember to ask. Um, act, don't react is a very helpful Al-Anon slogan. Another one that I have found to be a lifesaver is this one. I'll be right back. Instead of engaging, right? there, there was an election a few years ago, and oh, this was in the 90s, and there was an extremely cranky lady who showed up um, with a lot of personal problems, and she was a little snarly uh, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I met her, and, and she, she barked her demands, and my blood sugar was a little low. My first response was just to push her down the stairs. In Narcotics Anonymous, they say, first thought, wrong. And that was an example of this. The first thought is wrong. <laughs> and uh, I had about 10 or 15 seconds for the next thought to come up, and, and she flummoxed me. She, she knocked me off balance, and I was able to say, why don't you have a seat? I'll be right back with your ballot. And I, went, I had a glass of orange juice and, you know, did a little breathing. And I went back and we got her through 
the procedure, but my first response is not always the helpful one. I'll be right back. Blanche also said growing up in northern Florida, as a little girl, she was taught uh, what you don't know can't hurt you. And she said, what I did not know about alcoholism almost killed four people. So part of my Al-Anon recovery is keeping current and keeping up with what the disease looks like and what recovery looks like. And to be friendly to that process. I was leading a group in New York, a group of women, families and friends of alcoholics, weekend retreat. Um, Saturday I was available for people who wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. A woman of a certain age comes in and she says to me, if I knew you were an alcoholic, I never would have come. I said, oh. I said, what's that about? And she said, uh, you alcoholics ruin my life and ruin the lives of my children. And it was a husband who was alcoholic and her children are now married with their own families. So this has been going on for a while. So I'm just listening, getting a little information, and then I asked her, how long have you been coming to Al-Anon? And she said, nine years. First thought, have you listened to anything? Uh, <laughs> not helpful. I, I was able to say, uh, uh, if you need to leave, you can leave. You're not, you don't have to stay here. But you're welcome to stay here and, and learn about the disease and learn about the recovery. You're most welcome. And she stayed for the whole weekend. I don't know if she cheered up. That's not my responsibility. But when you're angry all the time, you could use some better information. Allergy of the body. Obsession of the mind. Blanche also said... In Al-Anon, we learn how to keep our sails out of other people's wind. And that was an image I needed to hear. Because I don't know if you noticed, but there's a lot of wind blowing. <laughs> and it's very easy for some of us to get caught up in other people's stuff. We feel part of, it's exciting, a sense of purpose and madness. And one of my Al-Anon slogans is uh, a lot of things are none of my business. Especially if I'm related to you. <laughs> a lot of things are none of my business. It's not up to me. And I, the Al-Anon focus is where I look at my own particular craziness on a regular basis and I can be thrown off, so knocked off balance by this whole business of being alive and the give and take. My sponsor thinks that in Al-Anon we learn how to be real human beings. This is the program of evolution and development. <laughs> Some of us begin our recovery and we're survivors. We don't know much about living, but we have survived, and some of us have survived the unspeakable. One of the, and I find some people difficult, I mean, I know you don't because of your perfect mental health, but <laughs> boy, some people get in my way and I just can't let go of them, and um, I can dislike them and I can obsess on them. That's still very, very possible. And one of my companions uh, in the Jesuit order, Greg Boyle, who works with gang members in LA, and some of them have an occasional alcohol or drug problem. One of the ways Greg deals with some very difficult people is he says, you need to realize that you don't know the burdens others are carrying. You don't know the burdens that others carry. 
And that gives me a little flicker of tolerance and kindness towards others. When I'm well rested and I've eaten well and I've been to a couple of dozen meetings in a row, um, I'm pretty easygoing. If I've cut back on meetings, if I've been eating crap, um, if I've been busy with all the stuff we can get busy about, I can get to be a little bit brittle. Oof. So Al-Anon. Um, I heard this as an Al-Anon slogan in Southern California. It was spoken to me by a priest who was a naval chaplain, Navy chaplain, an Al-Anon AA guy. And he said he's learned in his recovery, don't take the bait. Um, and again, AAs will just look confused when you say something like that. Um, and they don't know that they are the bait. <laughs> and you can become a lunatic by, by doing some of this. Growing up, uh, my, my parents were easy to play. If you mention certain things, uh, it was fun just to watch them react. And so that was years and years of misery. Uh, we had relatives who hated Franklin Roosevelt, so just mentioned the New Deal, and they were good for an hour. Um, and that was fun, you know. But it, it's, it's less fun to play that kind of stuff after a while. Don't take the bait. I'm talking to someone this is an almost impossible person. There's 10,000 things that are wrong. I want to help. My mouth goes dry. My breathing changes. This is an opportunity to fix, help, manage, control. And then years from now, she'll mention my name, that I saved her life, and you know, found a place for the goats to live, something like that. <laughs> and I've had this experience before where if I begin this dance, it ends up with me being completely crazy. Don't take the bait. <sighs> live and let live, pretty good slogan. It means I get to live and make decisions and make a zillion mistakes. And so does everyone else. I, I've done a little bit of language teaching in Southeast Asia. It was a great, I mean, a great opportunity to, to spend some time in Vietnam, in Thailand, in Myanmar, uh, you, young adults. It was very, very uh, wonderful. But you're starting to learn foreign language. And a lot of people are terrified of making a mistake. They're going to use the wrong pronoun, or they're going to pronounce things wrong. Or We were in Laos, and uh, one of my students um, tept, kept talking about giving arms. Arms. How do you give an arm? I thought, is this some kind of... Uh, well, it's ALM, A-L-M-S, because L's and R's get very confused. And um, he was talking about giving alms away, not arms away. Now, that's a mistake. And I have the choice of ridiculing him for that and saying, oh, you should know better. Or I can say, it's another one of our 10,000 mistakes. In learning a foreign language, the good news is hurry up and make your first 10,000 mistakes. This will be followed by your second set of 10,000 mistakes. And recoveries a lot like that. We're thinking differently, we're talking differently, we're interacting differently. You get to make a lot of mistakes without shame. It's how we learn. 
Oh my, I, I was in language school and I'd make a mistake and I'd say, oh, I'm so sorry. And my teacher said, you don't have to be sorry. You're learning. Oh, but I'd rather be sorry than learn, which is a, an unhappy place to spend years and years and years. So, uh, al -Anon. one more thing my sponsor told me. Um, recovery is not efficient and recovery is not neat. Uh, some of us would prefer that it were quick and we'd look really good all the time. And that's not the experience of a lot of us. Angry, afraid, those are pretty ordinary experiences. The feeling that I hate, though, perhaps as much as any other, is the feeling of being awkward, I hate that, or slow, or thick, or that I miss the joke. I don't like those feelings at all, and I just want to tell you I have them a lot when I allow myself to notice that they're there. Tuesday, a Monday night, I was at a men's al -Anon meeting in Albany. I haven't been in a year. Why haven't I been in a year? It's too late. It's 8 o'clock. I'm done. And it's too far away. 15, 20 minutes. Impossible. <laughs> and the last time I was there, I didn't like somebody. <laughs> so it's a year later. And I was back. And I, I was able to be there as someone participating in this process of paying attention. And we read the literature. We go through, there's a, a new thing printed last year, and we're going to 12 steps and 12 traditions and 12 concepts. So we're looking at things about recovery. And there weren't a lot of people in there, uh, six guys. But I was there one year. Um, one day, and people shared a little bit, and the first guy talked about being a kid in a crazy home, and um, he'd run away from home a lot. Same thing for the next guy, he'd run away from home a lot. Third guy, run away from home a lot. Now I'm comparing, and I didn't run away from home a lot. I didn't start running away from home till I was about 35 years old. Now I admire it very much, and I recommend it to many. Go do that. It'll help you. So I was feeling less then, and I was comparing, and oh, this is bad, and what's wrong with me? And then I had the realization that the reason I didn't run away from home a lot was because I discovered books. I could leave the house without walking out the front door. I would just open a book, and I became a voracious Reader, still am, still read a lot. And I read all kinds of things. And um, I discovered, uh, being half Scandinavian, this um, uh, Sigrid Unset won the Nobel Prize in 1926 or 27. This is so obscure. And uh, she writes this spectacular thing on Middle Ages in Northern Europe, a little depressed, uh, Ice Age, bubonic plague. It's everything you'd want in a book. <laughs> And it's called Kristen Lovren's Daughter. It's the story of a woman's life, as she's a young girl, as a married person, as a widow. And it is superbly written, and she is such a good storyteller. And I was reading it uh, this afternoon, and of course, everyone's drinking, and all the drunks are mouthing off, and there's yelling, and there's screaming, and there's accusations, and things being thrown. And the next morning, they're hung, oh, oh we didn't mean it. We were just drunk. And I said, I recognize these people. I am related to these people. Um, reading. C.S. Lewis says, we read to know we're not alone. The literature is very helpful. Other things are very helpful, ways of connecting us. Um, two more things, and then we can have a discussion, perhaps. 
I think the end, end run, the end result of any good addiction is a lot of isolation and a fair amount of self-loathing. I've got that. I used to have it all the time. Now, it, every so often, it shows up. But when it comes, I recognize it. You know, it's there. Um, um, last year, I woke up, and my, my first thought, my first thought, I was lying on my back. My first thought was, Tom, you're an idiot. First thought. Out of the blue. So what have I learned to do? Get out of bed. Start moving. Glass of water. Shower. Cup of coffee. Don't lie there analyzing the thought. Because I become more paralyzed. I like the action of the program. Get something done. And maybe make a few phone calls. But the end result of any good addiction is a lot of isolation and self-loathing. So recovery has a lot to do with making connections with other people. The way my sponsor nags, uh, identify, don't compare, identify, don't compare, identify, don't compare. And that means I need to learn how to listen and how to build the bridge. And a lot of recovery starts by saying hello and just showing up and just showing up and just showing up. And you don't know the burdens Others have carried, others have, and, and, and you start getting to know people. Now, I don't care what the addiction is. It might be the addiction of fixing everybody else in the room. It might be the addiction of making decisions for everybody because they don't know anything. It might be the decision or the addiction to excitement and adrenaline because I'm so good at it and it's an emergency and I'm at my best. It might be... Um, you know, the addiction of 12 loaves of French bread or, you know, 18 hours of internet porn or four bottles of vodka. At the end of the run, you're isolated and you're alone and you may have a little bit of self-loathing. So a decision to come to meetings for many of us is a very good decision because it helps us a little bit with the isolation. Getting to that meeting Monday night, I, I thought I deserved the Nobel Prize for going. <laughs> and it was a very good thing. I may even go back next Monday night. I don't get fixed, but I get a daily reprieve from a lot of my crazy. Um, and uh, I know stuff, but I don't remember what I know. It's another reason to go to meetings. People remind me of things that I vitally need to know. And uh, keeping it basic and keeping it simple and keeping it friendly. It's such good news. So, I'm done. If there's anything I said that's helpful, please use it. If I made no sense to you at all, um, that makes me feel better about myself. Um, it means I am talking about real things. Um, and, and we get to be vulnerable with each other, and we get to be gentle with each other, and we get to build bridges with each other. And I think that's really, really good news. Um, because of Al-Anon, I was able to have some kind of relationship with my parents before they died. There had been some years with virtually no relationship. And because of Al-Anon, I have some relationship with other members of my family, and that's really, really tough. 
You know, I wish I liked them more. <laughs> um, but I've learned to be civil, polite, respectful, and friendly. And it can cost sometimes. My oldest brother's impossible and he votes for war criminals and he shouldn't be given the franchise. However, we were having a conversation. And it was very clear that in this conversation I was right and he was wrong. And I almost said, do you realize that I am right and you are wrong? But I didn't say it. Because why start an another argument? And so, uh, by the way, it was his birthday too, so that, my present to him was keeping my big fat mouth shut. And I want you to know I did not feel good about that. I didn't feel evolved and superior. I had to go and call my sponsor and say, I missed an opportunity to tell my brother he's wrong. But sometimes that's what Al-Anon recovery looks like. You kept your big, fat mouth shut. There's hope for the whole world. <laughs> so there. <laughs>